Today, we're very happy to have Dr. Kent Condi. Um, Dr. Condi is Professor Emeritus of Geochemistry in Earth and Environmental Science at New Mexico Tech. Um, one of the most important facts about him is that he is one of our own departmental alums, and he got both his bachelor's and his master's here at the University of Utah, and then he went on to get a PhD from UC San Diego. Um, Kent has been a GSA fellow, um, uh, honorary uh, title, but probably most importantly, he received GSA's highest medal, that is the Penrose Medal of 2018, and that's really a reflection of the respect that people have for the work that he's done. He also received an honorary doctorate degree from University of Pretoria in South Africa in 2007. Uh, he's one of the most regularly cited authors from New Mexico Tech um, on ResearchGate. He's traveled all over the world uh, looking at some of the very oldest rocks of the Earth. And when we say um, people that look through deep time, Kent's one of the people that looked through some of the deepest parts of Earth's history. He's been an author of several books on fake tectonics, and I don't know if um, if Jim Kirkland is here, but uh, Jim Kirkland actually emailed me that he remembered taking one of uh, Kent's classes uh, <laughs> on plate tectonics. So today he's going to give us a lecture when did plate tectonics begin on planet Earth, huge transitions in the last four billion years. So thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you, Margie. It's, it's great to be back. I remember coming here 19... 55 and walking up the steep hill down here to take the entrance exam here and um, if I can get that to change I came with a very lucrative scholarship as you can see here if you can read that <laughs> and um, this is a uh, view of the College of Mines and Mineral Industries, as it was called then, about 1958. And I'm standing on the left there holding a phone from some geophysical instrument. And you can see here, Armin Erdley was the, the dean at this time. And um, the departments are listed over there. Is there a pointer here someplace? Maybe this, huh? If I know how to use it. No, that's a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Anyway, you can see that um, the departments were a little different. They were all individual departments in those days. And uh, Salt Lake was a little different then too, but it was still known for its airport, a very famous airport here in Salt Lake. There was only one problem. I don't know whether you can see this very well, but they had a problem with planes landing at the wrong place, so they painted on top of the tabernacle down here, airport and an arrow pointing to the west so that they wouldn't have any more attempted landings on Temple Square. Um, actually, this dates even before my time. This is in the late 1930s. But <laughs> Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about what's been going on in this world about plate tectonics. I've been working on this now for many, many years. And um, as you can see from the scale on the side here as to when plate tectonics began, you can almost name your number, extending from four billion years plus down here at the bottom, up to about in the Neoproterozoic up there as to when plate tectonics begun. Um, this is a little embarrassing when you show it to physicists or biologists who have things down more accurately to see how uncertain we are as to when plate tectonics began. Uh, we know a lot about how plate tectonics began from numerical models that have gone on in the last 10 years in particular and the processes there. So I'm not going to talk about that very much. The question is when it began and to address this question, I think you have to go to the geologic record. The geologic record has that information in there. It's just a matter of sorting through. It's, it's a little faint, but see, we press that this top, one. One, top one. Yep, okay. And there are two transitions I think are very important. Transition number one and number two. 
where there are dramatic changes in Earth's geologic history and its geochemical history. And I think they're very important in telling us about the tectonic environment of this planet and what was going on. Also important is the fact that we have a geologic record that goes back to over three and a half billion years. This was on a field trip in South Africa, and these are pillow basalts. A uh, little washed out here from the color, but the age of this pillow basalt section is 3.5 billion years in age. So we have rocks that are that old that still preserve beautifully primary textures and structures that we can study. Let's start out with the transition number one. You see, I have a list of 22 things. That'll take me about three hours to go through that list. <laughs> so I'm going to not cover all of them. But there, uh, actually, that list was, it, there were 16 things on that list as early as earlier this year. We're finding more and more things that occurred during this period of time between 3 billion and 2 billion years ago. That's got to be telling us something. I'm going to go over some of these today and talk about them. One of the first ones that's most important is our ages. This is part of the global data best that Steve Pitts and I have been putting together. We have about 700,000 in here at this time. We now have close to a million zircon ages. These are detrital zircon ages. And you can see the distribution is not uniform. There are peaks down here. And you'll notice that the first big peak we get here at about 2.7 and 2.5. And the next one up here is around 2 and 1.9 or so. Um, we don't have big peaks before then. Why do we start with these big peaks in zircon ages about 2.7 billion years ago? Something happened. Something changed in Earth history then. One of the most prominent ways that we can tell about moving plates is looking at the paleomagnetic record. And there's a lot of controversy when you get back to rocks this old because magnetism can be overprinted, ages can be overprinted. It's very difficult to decide on what is the age of the magnetism and what is the age of the rock. There are, very, there are five paleopole reliability tests that really need to be associated with any magnetic direction you get in the past. And there are two studies here uh, which do that. They look at these five paleomagnetic tests, which I have on a slide near the end. If anybody wants to see what they are, I'm not going to go through them. But if you look at this, and you look at the Pilbara Craton here in Western Australia, it's 3.5 billion year old rocks. At 2772 or so, um, the Pilbara Craton Pole was up in this area. By 2720, it was down here. We had thousands of kilometers of lateral motion of the Pilbara Craton going on at around 2.7 billion years in age. That's a constraint that has to go into when plate tectonics began, and it has to go into an a, a constraint on transition number one, what is causing it. Over here is another example. This is a little bit later, but it involves three cratons here in North America, the Superior Craton, the Ray Hearn, and the Slave Craton. You can see the Superior Craton went through a lot of offset here, and the dates we're talking about here are 2000 to 1750 for the Superior, Slave Craton 1900 to 1750, um, and the Hearn, uh, Ray Hearn from about uh, 1800 to 1750. They were all moving independently of each other until about 1750. From that time on, it appears like they were part of the same craton. That's the nucleus of the North American craton that formed around 1750 billion years ago. So we had lateral motions going on. Now, lateral motions doesn't necessarily mean lateral or, or global plate tectonics. One of the key features of plate tectonics today is the linkage between the plate boundaries. If you look at the modern plates here, both the spreading centers, the uh, convergent zones, and this transcurrent faults, they're all connected. We have an array 
of connection between all these which connect the plates together in a global network. And so if we're going to look for global plate tectonics in the past, what we want to look for is evidence for plate connection. The earliest one I know of comes at about 1650 MA over here. This is a reconstruction from Sergei Pizoresky, who we're working with, is a very careful uh, paleomagnetist that looks at Precambrian. This is the, probably our first supercontinent. And you'll notice it's known as Nuna or Columbia. The red origins here are collisional origins, which are responsible for cratons colliding together to make the uh, mega cratons from which the supercontinent was made. But I want to call your attention to this accretionary origin, which goes along the west coast of, this is Laurentia, North America, and this is Western Europe. Uh, there's some question about whether India was here or not, but nevertheless, you've got a very long accretionary origin here which suggests indeed there was significant leakage going on by 1650 million years ago. Another thing that's important is looking at these origins in more detail. As I mentioned, there are two major types of origins, the accretionary origins, like we have around the coast of the Andes today, where we have new material being added from the subducted plate, and we have reworked older material in here, but it's all along the margin. And the collision type, which you're all familiar with, the, is an example here with the Himalayan uh, collision with um, Asia some 65 million years ago. If we look at the distribution over here, the number of collisional origins with time, each one of these is the compilation of that number. And you'll notice that there's a peak. Our first peak up here is around 2 billion years ago. And then we have a couple others here. These are all beginning when we started to form our first supercontinent, which are the blue stripes on here. We had a lot of uh, cratons at those times. And this is another way of showing it over here, which actually is the number of cratons divided by two. And you'll notice that that number dropped off significantly after uh, around two billion years ago. And the reason it dropped off significantly is these cratons were colliding with each other and becoming part of mega cratons, okay? dropped off dramatically fast. This is a rock type that's very important as to when and how plate tectonics begun. Maybe some of you recognize this is the rock type eclogite. You take a basalt and you take it down to high enough pressure and temperature, the minerals invert to high pressure minerals. You can see the garnet in here, magnesium rich garnet. Most of this material here is a sodium rich clinopyroxene known as omphacite. The density of this rock is significant, can be higher than 3.5. Under normal conditions in the Earth, this would start to sink. And sinking is what is important for plate tectonics. But it doesn't necessarily imply lateral motions. All it implies is some sort of density change which causes the material or the lithosphere to sink with time. If we look at metamorphic gradients with time, we see an interesting relationship that Mike Brown has been working on. What is shown here is the temperature pr pressure gradient expressed in Giga Pascal. And it's divided into the high temperature pressure, intermediate and low. Notice the high and the intermediate. They begin roughly here at about 2.7 billion years ago. And the reason they begin there in a big way is because that's when we got all those collisional origins and both high and intermediate TPs are associated with collisional origins. And we have them from then on, okay? We have them from then on. Also, the first eclogites appear back here at about 2.7, 2.8 billion years ago. I've got a sample of what at that time I collected was the oldest eclogite at 2.8 billion years. I think there's some that are a little older than that now. Steve Sherry has been working on inclusions in diamonds. And here we have uh, di diamond inclusions back to four billion years in age or so. Um, and you'll notice a very abrupt change here at about three billion years in the nature of those inclusions. We have eclogitic assemblages, which are given over here, and peridytic, peridytic assemblages, that's olivine and clinopyroxene before that time. These eclogitic assemblages really don't appear until about 3 billion years ago. 
something very dramatically happened in diamonds, which are coming from greater than 150 kilometers deep in the earth. They were trapping a different type of mineral assemblage, a mafic assemblage that had inverted to eclogite beginning about three billion years ago. Something else are changes in the composition of the continental crust between about 2.7 and 2 billion years ago. I've got four of them down here. There's about 15 or 20. Depends on how fine you want to make the compositional parameters as to how many changes you get. I'm just going to mention these. But all of them show one thing in common, and that is a dramatic change at the end of the Archean at about 2.5 billion years ago. If we look up here at banded iron formation, the nickel iron ratio over here drops off dramatically at that time suggesting there was something very different in the uh, composition of the material that was going into seawater. It was much higher in nickel uh, prior to two and a half billion years ago. If we go over here and look at the rubidium-strontium ratio, which records the maficity or the basicity of the crust, okay, it's expressed over here in silica content. Uh, if we take the mean value of that, we see that up until about three billion years ago, we were down around 50% silica on the average composition of the crust. 50% silica, that's mafic, that's basaltic. But then things started to change very rapidly. We increased it up, got up to here uh, into felsic crust um, with the main changes between two and three billion years ago here. There may or may not have been a peak up here that's, that's still an issue that's hotly debated among uh, individuals in this field. But the important thing for my purpose in this talk is how rapidly that change occurred between two and three billion years ago. If we come down here now to platinum group elements, these are the PGEs. And um, if we look at them, they're divided here into different age groups. But um, if you look at the normal ones that are Paleozoic and Neoproterozoic, this is the sort of distribution you have over here. This is osmium through rhenium. But if you look at Mesoarchean back here, three billion years ago, we see that they, there's a different distribution, especially of osmium, iridium, and ruthenium. They're much higher, indicating the source area at that time was different. It was more mafic and ultramafic in composition. And then if we come over here to TTGs and CAs, um, by TTGs, this is an abbreviation for tonalite, uh, Trongemite granite diorite, three big names, but it's an assemblage of granitic rocks that are common in the Archean. And the CAs are calc-alkaline granitic rocks, which are more common after the Archean. And this is a distribution of number of sites. You'll notice that in the Archean, the TTGs are quite frequent. But beginning here in the late Archean, in, uh, about three billion years ago, they drop off dramatically. There's a comeback here, which is interesting. This is mainly in the Andes. But this transition from TTGs to calcalkalines is an important transition. Calcalkaline igneous rocks are characteristic of convergent margins. They're not limited to convergent margins, but they're characteristic of convergent margins. Something else that's important are ophiolites. Ophiolites are fragments of oceanic crust been deformed, but sometimes they're caught up in collisional zones like in the Himalayas, and they're preserved. And there are big belts of these today. Here's a typical complete ophiolite down here. We have very rare examples. This is the oldest complete ophiolite I know of, 1995 million years. I've walked over that with the person who described it. Up at the top up here you have carbonate rocks, which have been in pelagic sediments, pillow basalts, and then you have sheeted dike swarms, uh, layered gabbros, and finally ultramafic material, depleted ultramafic material. These are very rare, even in the Phanerozoic, to have a complete ophiolite. Most of them are deformed, and you get pieces. This is an example of an old one over here, which is deformed, and you have several pieces in here, but you still have these component parts in it. This one's 1998. Well, if you look at the distribution of ophiolites, the oldest ones we have are listed up here, and they come in around two billion years ago into the record. Ophiolites, fragments 
of oceanic crust formed at ocean spreading centers. Ocean spreading centers are part of plate tectonic. By two billion years ago, we had in place. There have been Ophiolites described earlier in this from the Archean. None of them have survived the criticisms and the scrutiny of people who have worked with younger Ophiolites as being true Ophiolites. Another interesting thing here is the changes in the composition of mafic and ultramafic igneous rocks through time. This comes after Brennan Keller, who studied these. This is MGO, chromium, and nickel. And these are the median values with one standard deviation. And you'll notice where I've got the green stripe here, we get a dramatic drop in the MGO content of mafic and ultramafic igneous rocks. Same thing with chromium and nickel. And you can take the major elements and calculate what this means in terms of the degree of melting in the mantle, which is done down here. And you get a drop in the degree of melting from the order of, what, 30% to 10% during this period of time, between two and three billion years ago. Something was going on. Something was going on in the mantle that caused a drop in the degree of melting of the mantle between two and three billion years ago. This comes from our studies, also using, in this case we've used basalts, we haven't used ultramafic rocks in this, or commodities. And this is between 2.7 and 1.7 that we see a dramatic change. But if we look at here of basalts from enriched mantle sources, these are sources that are enriched in incompatible elements like rubidium and strontium and barium and light rare earths. And we can calculate a mantle potential temperature from the major elements. And what we know about the distribution of mantle potential temperatures today uh, from modern oceanic basalts. The mantle potential temperature is the extrapolation of the mantle adiabat up to your surface. It gives you an idea in rough terms what the temperature is at the base of the oceanic lithosphere. That's what mantle potential temperature is. And you'll see that hasn't changed much with time in the enriched sources around 1500. But if we go to the depleted sources, these are the ones that are erupted at ocean ridges. We see a dramatic drop starting here in the late Archean. And I put these down here so they show up better. Here's the enriched mantle, and here's the depleted mantle curve. And that deviation begins here between two and three billion years ago. We start to see two thermal components in the mantle. One that doesn't change very much. Today, we see that in mantle plumes associated with hot spots like Hawaii and Iceland and Samoa. And the other one, which began to change and is continuing to drop with time, is our ambient mantle. This is the mantle from which ocean ridge basalts come from and some continental basalts. Again, we're back to this time between two and three billion years that something was happening in the mantle. Again, some more work from our studies of the geochemistry of the mantle between 2.7 and 1.8. I've shown here a couple of incompatible element ratios, zirconium, niobium, niobium, thorium. And if we look at young basalts here less than 100 million years, we see three populations really fall out of oceanic basalts. The enriched basalts, which are these guys, those are the ones that come from hot spots. Depleted mantle, which are the ones that come from ocean ridges. And hydrated mantle, these are the ones that come from arc systems. So we get three nice populations, but we go back to two and a half billion years ago over here, we don't see those. <laughs> we get one population that sort of scatters between the uh, hydrated field and the depleted field with nothing in the in a rich field. That's two and a half billion years ago. Something has happened between the late Archean and today between these mantle reservoirs. And how fast did that happen? Down here, um, I show the percent of enriched mantle based on the zirconium-niobium ratio, this ratio over here, versus time. And this is for arc-type basalts and non-arc-type basalts, okay, through time. And both of those show a dramatic increase between two and three billion years ago. A dramatic increase in the percent of EM, which we got today, we didn't have it two, two and a half to speak of, very low down here, but it increased very rapidly. 
So we're getting an enriched mantle reservoir, which we see developing in the late Archean and into the Paleoproterozoic. Another way we can look at this is to look at mantle xenoliths. Now mantle xenoliths give us an opportunity to date events in the mantle. We don't get zircons in the mantle usually unless they are been introduced as contaminants from the crust. But we do see xenolith populations which represent pieces of the mantle which have been brought to the Earth's surface. These are also mafic rocks. We can date these by a method known as the rhenium-osmium method. Rhenium is a very incompatible element. Upon melting, it goes into the melt, goes upstairs into the crust. It leaves then osmium-186 left in the mantle. And by looking at the rhenium-osmium ratio, we can actually date when that event. That's known as a rhenium depletion age. When we look at that, notice we got a peak here at 2702. At the same time, we had two peaks in the zircon population indicating it wasn't just in the crust upstairs, but something was going on in the mantle downstairs at those two periods of time, 2.7 and 1 point, or 2.0 or so. Let's look at large igneous provinces. For those of you not familiar with them, I've shown some young ones out here. Columbia River basalts up here is a young igneous province. Iceland is an, 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 another one. Angtong Java here in the Western Pacific is another one. The Siberian Traps are another one. These are, most of them are thought to be the products of mantle plume activity, where you've had magmas produced very rapidly and erupted or intruded at your surface or both. If we look at the distribution of lip events on, that occur on more than, or equal to or more than six cratons with time, each one of these is a histogram showing those distributions. You notice the period of time that I've colored him again between two and three billion years ago. We really get a lot of lips. And then we come back to a period where there's not so many. And then we get a renewed period up here. But our first big period of lip activity, that is mantle plume activity, probably, we can't be sure of that, but probably, was between two and three billion years ago. Mantle plumes, where do they come from? We don't know. But a lot of data suggests they come from deep in the mantle, probably at the large low-velocity provinces, of which there are two today, one under Africa, extends into the North Pacific, another under the South Pacific. Probably most of our large igneous, our, our major um, plume activity is generated in one of those two provinces today. It started all during this period of time between two and three billion years ago, for some reason. Another thing that's interesting is when did continents become emergent above sea level? I've shown on here three indices that are thought to monitor that. Uh, well, this is where a Mac and a PC do not share something in common. The PC tends to leave out some of the critical information on the slide. Anyway, the bottom one here is the oxygen isotope composition of zircons. And it, it's looking at the 1816. The 1816 ratio is preferred uh, in sedimentary zircons or zircons that have gone through the weathering cycle. You enrich oxygen 18. If we look at detrital zircons here, we see a dramatic increase in the 1816 ratio as we go between two and three billion years ago, roughly. That suggests we what? We had greater percentage of the continents above sea level to undergo weathering, okay? We can see the same thing with the strontium-87-86 curve, which is monitored by the rubidium-strontium ratio. Uh, if we look at that, you also get a very rapid increase here. The, the higher the uh, strontium-87-86 ratio, the higher the rubidium-strontium ratio, the higher the rubidium-strontium ratio from the previous slide, the more felsic, the continental crust, above sea level in this case, because you have to weather it, that high felsic, or that high rubidium-strontium crust to get the strontium isotope signature transferred into seawater. Same thing happens with zinc isotopes. Zinc 64 and zinc 66 is preferred. And if we look at the 
uh, this should be the 66-64 ratio uh, in sediments. We look at that with time, there's a tremendous increase there, suggesting that the weathering input from continental crust was increasing that during the time. The bottom line is here, between two and three billion years ago, continents became more emergent above sea level. Continents became more emergent above sea level. <coughs> so, just a few summary items from transition one. There are 22 of them, and I went through about what, six or eight of them. Uh, if you look at them all here, three mantle reservoirs, ophiolites, lateral plate motions, collisional origins, continental emergence, global plume events, and the great thermal uh, divergence. Could it be that some three billion years ago is when plate tectonics began on this planet and it became well established by two billion years ago? And during this period of time, we had an evolution occur, which we see manifest in such things as I've shown you here in the geologic record. I'll leave that question with you. And now let's move on to transition number two. Transition number two, as you remember, occurs in the Neoproterozoic, beginning perhaps a billion years ago and going into the lower Paleozoic. Uh, maybe 500 million years ago. And this is a key rock type in the second transition. This is a blue schist. This one comes from the Franciscan complex, but the blue mineral in here, maybe many of you are already familiar with that, is an amphibole known as glaucophane. This is a sodium-rich amphibole that forms at very high pressures, but at low temperatures. Very high pressures and low temperatures. There's also some green in here, some of that's epidote, some of it's chlorite from retrograde metamorphic reactions. There's also some lawsonite in here. Lawsonite's a colorless mineral, but it's also a very high pressure mineral that forms at high pressures and low temperatures. This is a key rock type in the second transition. And let's take a look at it in terms of the slide we looked at a minute ago, in terms of temperature pressure gradients with time. These are low temperature uh, DTDPs, low gradients. This is where we get high pressure minerals formed at low temperatures. They're the blue dots on this diagram. And you notice they don't really become abundant until after one billion years ago. There are two examples out here. Both of those are yet to be 100% verified. And this one I think is verified. But nevertheless, the abundance of these guys doesn't occur until after one billion years ago. And then they pick up tremendously. What was going on at this time? This is a summary of many of the transitions that occur during what I call the second transition. This is a slide that he made up. Um, and we list these over here. If we look at ophiolites again, here are the ophiolites we looked at a few minutes ago that come in around two billion years ago. There's a big period of time here with no ophiolites that we found. Then they come in again here after about a 900 million years ago, but they really don't become really prolific until oh, maybe two hundred last 200 million years. Th this is due me to this is where people have worked. There's a lot of nice areas to work in the Himalayas and others where we got ophiolites preserved. So you've got to be always careful of these histograms in terms of the height of the peaks because they not only reflect the abundance of what you're trying to show, but they reflect where scientists have worked for either scientific reasons or perhaps other reasons. It's where we got a lot of data. Um, blue schist now. These are the glaucophane bearing ones. They have the same distribution as the ophiolites, basically. Lawsonite bearing rocks, this is lawsonite, the hydrous calcium aluminite phase. Same sort of distribution. Jadeite, the sodium, a high sodium aluminum um, amp uh, uh, pyroxene, clinopyroxene, same sort of distribution. Ultra high pressure metamorphic rocks. These are rocks that form at relatively low temperature, but ultra high pressure, even higher pressure than the blue schists. 
same distribution. Some gemstones here, ruby and sapphire, they form in collisional origins. Same sort of distribution for the most part, although there's some older examples. So clearly, as Bob Stern has pointed out, something happened here between 1,000 and 600 million years ago in Earth history. Something happened. He interprets that as the start of plate tectonics. And he and I go round and round about that. I don't think it's the start. I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. But he's right. Something did happen there. Something happened to the plate tectonics that was already operating on this planet, I think. Some other things that happened there. Melanges. Maybe some of you have seen melanges. They come into the picture about 700 million years ago. Here's some pictures of the Francisco melange. Now, if you've been off the coast of California, right by there in San Francisco and all down the coast, you see here we have great big chunks of mafic rock, volcanic rock, felsic volcanic rock, chert, gray wacky. It's the garbage can of rock types. They're all mixed together on all scales from very large scales, larger than the size of this room, to very small scales. They form in what's known as the subduction channel. This is how they're interpreted. This is a, the channel on top of the subduction zone where we get these pieces torn off. They require brittle deformation to tor tear them off, fragment them, mix them together. And, and in some cases, we bring those back up as shown by the arrows here up to the surface, where in a later geologic record we can actually sample these melanges. They're a characteristic feature of subduction. Yet the first definitive melanges that we find are not back in transition number one, they're in transition number two. Now if we go to uh, the work of Teres Guerra in Zurich and his students and postdocs, they've made a tremendous contribution to understanding what this second transition is in the last 10 years. Elena Sazova did her PhD on this in 2013. And these are based on numerical models uh, for cool and hot origins. This would be something analogous today where we have a relatively cool origin. And in cool origins, we can actually start to subduct continental crust. The gray color here is continental crust. It can be subducted. And it can also be brought back up to the surface as shown by this arrow because the lithosphere is stronger and it's behaving in a more brittle fashion. The lithosphere was stronger and behaving in a more brittle fashion. It's because everything has cooled off more from earlier times. We don't see this in the first transition because things were too hot. As shown in the second thing over here, second cross section. Notice the subduction zone doesn't go deep at all. And when it did go down here, it broke off. You can't get these subduction zones to not break off when it's too hot. If it's over 100, 150 degrees hotter in the upper mantle than it is today, the subducting plate necks, breaks off, and sinks. You can't sustain subduction. You can't sustain subduction when it's hotter. So this was a transition that occurred between 1,000 and 700 million years ago, where I think we went from a hot, weaker lithosphere to a cool, stronger lithosphere with plate tectonics still in action. Um, if we look at uh, what was going on in the mantle, again, we're going to look at the zirconium niobium, which is an incompatible element ratio versus time in oceanic basalts. This is what was happening during the first transition, but what I want to call your attention to is the variability here in the last uh, billion years or so. The length of these red lines are one standard deviation. These are median values, incidentally, of this ratio in basalts. They become much more variable. Here's a rich mantle down here. Here's depleted mantle up here. This is primitive mantle, and that's continental crust. So we got a, a much greater variation in the last 700 million years. To make that more obvious, I have plotted the standard deviation of the mean of zirconium niodium versus time over here. And you can see this rapid increase, as I indicate down here, um, in the last 1,000 million years. The variation becomes very significant. I think this is due to the onset of recycling of continental sediments 
into the lithosphere, uh, or uh, of the lithosphere and the lithosphere into the mantle sources of oceanic basalts. Thus you're getting this more enriched signature. Why do you do that? Why do you get more enriched signature? Because you subduct more continental crust into the mantle. You can't do this till you can start subducting continental crust. Once you start subducting continental crust, probably most of this goes down to sediments. It gets down into the source areas of the basalts and contaminates those source areas. And you start seeing that signature being brought up in the basalts. This is sort of a summary of some of the changes in the second transition here. Ophiolites, sheeted dikes, they start a little earlier, but they don't become abundant until later. Potiform chromite is something characteristic of oceanic spreading centers and ophiolites. It's very new, a newcomer in the picture. Uh, Hartsburgite, this is the depleted mantle left at ocean ridges, blue schists, accretionary prisms. This is the melange and ultra high pressure metamorphism. They're all over here, uh, not coming into picture too much later. So this is the super summary slide. What this has on it is the start date in Geiger years, billion years ago, given by the blue dot for the first transition and the red dot for the second transition. And this is age down here. There's our 22 changes that we record, and that's an ongoing number. <laughs> it's not going to get smaller, but yeah, I, I'm sure it'll get larger. Um, and you'll notice most of these changes are between two and three billion years ago. Some of them start a little earlier, some of them go a little later. And then the same thing for the first transition. Over here, we only have eight in here so far, but again, that depends on how fine you want to make your divisions. You could double that if you wanted to. Uh, filter your divisions and make them finer. And this is between oh, 1 billion years and 600 million years or 500 million years ago. So we certainly have, I think, evidence in the geologic record of two major transitions in the geologic record. And what I'd like to suggest is that this first transition represents the transition on this planet from a stagnant earth planet, a stagnant lid planet, where we didn't have plate tectonics to a planet that we did have plate tectonics. And the second transition represents a transition from subducting normal oceanic lithosphere to a transition or a time when we started to subduct continental lithosphere. And the lithosphere became much stronger. If we um, take a look at this in a little more detail, this comes from some of Jaren von Eunen's work here, where he's, uh, again, numerically modeled transition zones at temperatures today, where you see the subduction go down. Sometimes it's stalled here. These are the upper and lower boundaries of the mantle transition zone down here, but eventually it goes through. But if you go to a mantle that has 200 degrees hotter, what happens is you just get a starting of subduction and it breaks off, okay? You can see the break off there, the material goes down here. You can't sustain subduction at a hotter time. At the same time, the strength of the lithosphere increases. This comes from the work of Ray and Coltis and some of their collaborators. Again, with time down here, and this is the integrated strain up here at three different strain rates. It doesn't matter which one you choose. You'll notice that the thermal modeling suggests that between 2.7, 2.8 GA and 2 GA, there was a dramatic change in the steepness of the strength of the lithosphere. It began to get much steeper because of the falling temperatures in the Earth. And much stronger, much stronger lithosphere. So, Again, by way of summary here, as the Earth cooled and passed through two thermal thresholds, both involving an increase in lithospheric strength. The first one allowed subduction of mafic crust to occur between 3 and 2 GA, and a trend, it was a transition from a stagnant lid to a plate tectonic planet. 
Transition two allowed subduction of continental crust to occur between one and say 0.75 GA. This was a transition from what I call an early to a late plate tectonic regime. And if we look at this in terms of lithosphere strength with time, down here we have age. Up here we have mantle potential temperature. And that's the black curve. And that comes from the work of the study I showed you earlier on here, calculating mantle potential temperatures into the past. And lithosphere strength, which comes from the work, work of Ray and Coltis over here, assuming in this, we assume that the present day lithosphere has a strength around 500 megapascal. I checked with uh, several people in this business and they all agree that that's probably in the right ballpark of 500 megapascal. That's where these two curves cross. The first transition was given by this first blue curve and the second one by this. And you'll notice again, if you look at this strength curve, which is the red one, we get a rapid increase in strength between two and two and a half billion years ago here. And we get another rapid increase in here, between one and one and 500 million years ago. And sometime in the future, we're gonna get an even more rapid increase. And what I've done is project this into the future, which is of course dangerous and you really can't do that. But I've projected a billion years into the future, which is the minus one here, suggesting that sometime between 500 and a billion years in the future, we're going to pass through a third transition where the lithosphere becomes so strong, you can't subduct it at all. And plate tectonics will go away and we'll be back to a stagnant lid regime. But anyway, it's these first two where we have strengthening the lithosphere with time and somewhere in this time period here, there was a threshold. Once we passed that threshold, then we could subduct oceanic lithosphere and it would continue to subduct. Sometime between 500 million years ago and a billion years ago, somewhere in this time, we went through a second threshold, which allowed continental lithosphere to go down the tube for the first time. How are we doing on time here? I, I, I wanted to talk a little about what came before plate tectonics. There's been a lot out in the literature on that. I think I'll just briefly mention it. This is one of the models of Jean Bedard where you had vertical motions here. You had plumes coming up. You had drips coming down, but no lateral motion to speak of. This is more in web, but posed uh, heat pipe tectonics. Again, everything's occurring vertically. You had basalts stacked on the top and plates sinking and melting at the bottom. And there are several more variants of this that appeared in the literature in the last few years. Craig O'Neill has worked on this and he suggested that when plate tectonics came in, it didn't come in all at once, it came in in bursts. Sorry, this is out of focus, but um, you can see the, the peaks here anyway, that we were in a stagnant lid regime and occasionally we had bursts of plate tectonics until some two billion years ago when it became well established. And this just summarizes that in terms, again, the fields are not on here. This is a stagnant lid regime off to the right. This is a mixed regime here, which is stagnant lid with pulses of plate tectonics. And this is plate tectonics down here. And you can see that projected um, evolution. So basically, that leaves us with an evolution for the Earth in three basic stages. An active stagnant lid, where things were hot. That's probably where Venus is today, is an active stagnant lid. Between three and two, we went into an episodic stagnant lid where we had bursts of plate tectonic activity. Between two and a uh, billion years and one, we had an early plate tectonic and then a late plate tectonic regime. And sometime in the future, we'll go into a dead plate tectonic, or a dead stagnant lid regime. It's interesting to look at that in terms of uh, some of the other bodies in our solar system, sort of, we can break it down to maybe two types of regimes. One that goes with an active stagnant lid that moves into an inactive stagnant lid, it cools so fast 
And Mars and Moon appear to be in that today. They cooled very fast. They didn't go through a plate tectonic regime at all. Whereas the Earth went from an active to a transition into a plate tectonic regime and eventually in the future will also go into an inactive stagnant wind. I think I'll stop there. Thank you.